Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, everyone, um, or good evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name is Ismail Royer. Uh, I'm with the Religious Freedom Institute, and we're here with my colleague, uh, Jeremy Barker. Uh, I am the... Good morning. Good morning. I am the director of the Islam and Religious Freedom uh, Action Team at the uh, Religious Freedom Institute, and Jeremy is the director of the Middle East uh, Action Team. Uh, we are doing this uh, webinar as the first of a series of webinars on the relationship between Islam and uh, the state, Islam and the government authority. And it's part of a broader inquiry into um, the issue of religious freedom in the uh, uh, Muslim majority world. Um, we are interested in exploring what are the um, what are the what, what are the uh, prospects for um, freedom of both Muslims and non-Muslim minorities to practice their religion, and what is the relationship between that and um, Islam and uh, and and the state? So um, the purpose of this first webinar is to lay the theoretical and historical foundation by exploring the nation state's emergence in the early modern period. Uh, this development was a result of, a cont of contingent historical factors, but it's also associated with concepts such as the identification of the nation with the state, uh, the inviol inviolability of borders, popular sovereignty, centralization of power, and so on. Um, so what we're going, uh, we're going to um, first uh, introduce uh, Jeremy. Jeremy is the um, uh, senior program officer and director of the Middle East Action uh, Team for RFI. He has lived or worked in the Middle East since 2010, uh, including in Turkey and Northern Iraq for many years. Um, and he's worked in rights-based uh, relief uh, across the region from Iraq to Turkey to Egypt uh, to Morocco. And his full, fuller biography can be found on our website. We're also going to um, have with us uh, Osman Softic. Osman Softic is based in uh, Sarajevo. He's in Sarajevo now, and he's a senior scholar, uh, a senior research fellow with the Islamic Renaissance Front, which is an intellectual think tank based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, and he's also a projects coordinator for the recently established Foreign Relations Council in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, he graduated from the Faculty of Islamic Studies in Sarajevo and holds a master's degree in international relations from the University of New South Wales in Australia. So he's going to be one of our, um, one of our interlocutors today. And the star of our um, of our webinar today is uh, Dr. Leah Greenfeld. Dr. Leah Greenfeld is um, one of the, uh, if not the uh, greatest living scholar of nationalism and um, uh, the nation state today. She's a university professor and professor of sociology and political science and anthropology at Boston University. Uh, she's been called the, uh, one of the most original thinkers of the current period. Um, and uh, as someone who has been grappling with several of her works over the past few months, I, I can say that this is uh, absolutely accurate. Um, she is the author of the new, relatively recent Mind, Modernity, and Madness, The Impact of Culture on Human Experience, and her seminal work, Nationalism, Five Roads to Modernity. So, um, Jeremy, would you like to uh, say anything and, or, or a smile? Sure. Well, thank you, Ismail and Osman, Professor Greenfield. Thank you for, for joining. Um, Ismail mentioned the, this series of webinars is part of a, a broader group of activities of publications, of consultations that have been looking at kind of key questions around um, the around the principles that make up religious freedom, the right of individuals, whether from the minority or majority community, to be able to practice their faith. And so the, today's conversation, we really hope to, to set some of the foundational conversations of, of what that looks like. And, and so very pleased to have you join us and, and to really start out this question of laying the groundwork for, for a series of these, these farther conversations. Um, so um, you maybe want to open it up with a, an initial question. Sure. So, um, Dr. Greenfeld, this is a, uh, first of all, we're very blessed to have you here and, and we want to thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sure. Um, so, um, to start this off, I'd, I'd like to ask maybe if you could explain to, a, uh, to us um, what distinguishes the modern state from pre-modern socio-political organizations um, 
for example, what you've described as the society of orders. And maybe you can elaborate on that and then explain how um, the modern nation state um, arose out of the um, different historical and ideological uh, transformations that occurred in, in modernity. Yes, this indeed is um, a fundamental question, especially since uh, this is the focus of the uh, of your series of webinars, Islam and the modern state. Uh, in um, um, 16th century uh, English, uh, in which the concept of the state first appeared, it's a very new concept. Uh, it was um, the synonym of the nation. Uh, later, um, just about 50 years uh, later, um, towards the end of the 16th century, uh, this word acquired a more specific uh, meaning um, than just uh, it's the name of the nation. It became uh, the synonym of the uh, for the government of a nation and uh, the embodiment of one principle, one of the two most important principles of nationalism, the principle of popular sovereignty. Uh, there were no states before uh, nationalism, uh, political organizations and governments of um, the national world uh, to which we project uh, quite anachronistically our understanding uh, were governments of a very different uh, type. Uh, the state is being the embodiment of popular sovereignty and um, uh, a necessary uh, derivative from national consciousness is um, necessarily uh, an impersonal uh, and um, representative type of government. It is impersonal, um, for example, uh, by contrast to the essentially personal government of kingship. And it is a uh, representative government, even uh, uh, when uh, in cases of such seemingly personal dictatorship as uh, we have in the cases of, uh, for instance, Robespierre, uh, during the French Revolution, uh, Hitler, or uh, Mao, uh, because those leaders um, whom we would consider uh, today tyrants um, in distinction to, uh, to pre-modern tyrants, uh, they actually firmly believe themselves and uh, the populace believes them to be, uh, they represent the will of the people, the will of the nation. Now today, uh, of course, national consciousness is the dominant form of consciousness. Uh, and um, what is it? Uh, it is that all that really matters is uh, concentrated in this world, in the mundane, uh, to actually to a complete exclusion of the uh, significance of the transcendental spheres, and that uh, in a social and political uh, nature, reality, uh, is uh, uh, composed of uh, sovereign communities naturally, reality is naturally divided into sovereign communities 
of fundamentally equal members. And those communities are called nations. Um, again, uh, no political community uh, was ever called a nation before the age of nationalism, uh, before nationalism was born in England in the 16th century. So this is all, it's a very new type of identity uh, that is given one by the membership in a nation, by one's nationality. Now, this view of the world, this image of reality, this form of consciousness um, is now dominant. And as any dominant form of consciousness, uh, be it uh, communism in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, be it uh, the Society of Orders in the Middle Ages, uh, be it uh, uh, Caesar Papism in um, uh, Byzantium, any dominant form of consciousness, uh, we always take it for granted and we believe it uh, to be as uh, indeed inevitable, universal, and ideal form uh, of reality. Um, and yet it is uh, with all its values. And you see, I already mentioned um, three very important uh, values here. Uh, um, Egalitarianism, fundamental egalitarianism, to believe that naturally uh, society must be egalitarian and that equality is a supreme social good, uh, popular sovereignty, uh, and um, the focus on this world, the uh, importance. Uh, and meaningfulness, independent meaningfulness of this mundane world. Um, this is, in fact, like any other dominant form of consciousness, is uh, an historical phenomenon. Historical meaning that it is contingent based on uh, certain uh, uh, unpredictable historical uh, accidents coming together uh, and there is nothing necessary and nothing in fact ideal uh, in it uh, besides that we believe this to be today while it is dominant we believe it to be an ideal uh, the um, accidents that led to the emergence of this form of consci consciousness um were well, basically of two fundamentally of two um kinds one was uh, a, a purely purely historical fact that during uh, the wars of the roses which were the civil wars between two branches of um the royal family in England, the Lancasters and the Yorks, uh, uh, in those wars, uh, the entire, in fact, uh, feudal nobility of um, of England was physically destroyed. Uh, all the men of uh, the nobility were killed, uh, which left the uh, the whole upper stratum of the society uh, empty and um, and necessitated in fact uh, a very uh, uncommon at that time uncommon and totally illegitimate and therefore unimaginable uh, trend of massive upward mobility this was the first uh, accident and the other accident was that when this was happening 
the words uh, people and nation had a certain meaning. Uh, people basically meaning plebs or rebel, that is the lower classes, and um, uh, nation meaning uh, a tiny uh, elite of supreme decision makers. Now, because of this uh, massive upper mo mobility, the people who were mobile, they were mobile from the people, uh, from the plebs upward. And uh, in the consciousness of the society of orders, which was their dominant consciousness, the experience made absolutely no sense. Uh, in the consciousness of uh, the society of orders, the different orders differed physically, they differed qualitatively in blood. So the blood, they couldn't in fact mix. Uh, I mean, one couldn't imagine their, uh, the mixture between them. So they were mutually exclusive. And the people, the plebs, they had, it was believed had regular red blood and uh, the uh, upper order, the nobility had uh, blue blood. And so those upwardly mobile commoners who originated in the people, they had a very positive experience. Suddenly they were, you know, ruling the roost, but they couldn't understand it. It was, it was ununderstandable for them, their own experience, because they, they needed to rationalize it for themselves in the sense uh, of both making it understandable and making it legitimate. Uh, so suddenly, they, uh, somebody apparently had this bright idea uh, in the very beginning of the 16th century, this amazing idea, oh, the people of England is a nation. And this spread like wildfire mm -hmm. because, because it had such an enormous appeal uh, to the entire population. To those you know, who were leading the upward mobility and were emerging as the new aristocracy, but also to all the other strata that in fact followed them, you know, now occupying their places, originating even deeper below and occupying places of those uh, new aristocrats. So, um, and this is how nationalism was born. Uh, now, this very equation of uh, the people, meaning the lowest classes and the nation, that is the equation of the entire population with the supreme decision-making elite, elevated the entire populace, the people, to the dignity of the elite. Now it became something in which one would like to claim a membership before to say to somebody, oh, this is, you know, you are a member of the people. This would be an offense. If you said to a French nobleman, for example, look, you're, you're just a member of the people. I mean, this French nobleman would likely challenge you to a duel. <laughs> Uh, but now it became something so dignified that you would like to, to identify with that. It also made all the people, all the members of this community uh, equal, that is interchangeable, meaning that everyone now could occupy any position. It depended now on one's own choice so with this we have freedom of choice mm -hmm. the rise of individual freedom and uh the main uh 
equality was political equality, that is equality in self-governance, equality in popular sovereignty. So uh, this, this is what nationalism is, and this is why it has to have the state, you know, a representative yeah. government and the embodiment of popular sovereignty as a legitimate government. Every nation has its state as its government. And because this is the dominant view of, uh, of our age, even those who are not nations and not states, they claim to be nations and yeah. states. Hmm. Yeah, this is a fantastic and I think a really important um, point to make that while this is the ideal and, and maybe the dominant view, historically it's actually a rather new phenomenon where um, only back to the 16th century, um, and you've laid out, and I think that important principle of the equality, um, you also talk about two types of of nations of um, a composite and a, a unitary uh, as it relates to the primacy of the people. Can you maybe lay lay out kind of what that framework is and how that yeah, has a bearing? Right. Uh, well, actually there are three types of nationalism that uh, one discovers. You see, nationalism is that. Uh, the uh, fundamental view of reality of social political reality is naturally divided we all believe that nations are natural right mm -hmm. as naturally divided into sovereign communities of fundamentally equal members but those two principles of popular sovereignty and fundamental egalitarianism can be interpreted and uh, implemented in social institutions in three different ways. The original nationalism, English nationalism, which was then uh, uh, adopted uh, together with, I mean, brought by the uh, uh, immigrating Englishmen to the United States and to Australia, for instance, uh, this uh, original uh, consciousness was individualistic in its conception of the nation. It's very, very important that the word nation and the word people in English of that time and for some two centuries uh, longer was a plural noun the pronouns that con that corresponded to the word nation and to the word people were we and they mm. so every nation and every people you know like we the people right uh yes uh they were just constituted uh of those many, many individuals. And it is the individuals who gave their nature to the association because individuals now were defined as free and equal. That's why the nation and the people were a free and egalitarian nation and a free and egalitarian people. But this was this reflected uh, the nature of the specific English experience. You know, the experience was the experience of individuals. But when two centuries later, this happened only two hundred years later, other societies started importing this view from England, and. But the, again, the reason for the importation was purely accidental. It couldn't be predicted that this view would spread. Hmm. It spread because of its 
nationalism, because of its completely new uh, vision of the world, England became extremely competitive. It became extremely competitive uh, because the dignity of the personal identity of every member of the nation depended directly on this membership. Hmm. And therefore, Englishmen became tremendously committed to the overall dignity of the nation. That is, the standing of their nation among other nations. And of course, the Englishmen imagined the rest of the world as nations. The rest of the world was not nations in the consciousness of the other people, only in the English consciousness. And the moment the English perceived the world as the world of nations, they started seeing other that they considered nations threatening their dignity. For example, the Dutch, they thought they were too good in uh, uh, economically, you know, too good in trade. So mm -hmm. therefore, the English was an offense. And England had four Anglo-Dutch wars in which it was an aggressor all the time. And the Dutch couldn't understand what we want from them because they weren't competing. You see, they were living their life. They were no other, no other uh, polity was competing. They weren't at all competitive, right? Only the English, and because they became so competitive, indeed, they very quickly rose from a backward in every respect, not very significant kingdom to the status of a superpower. And now everyone around them were watching them. So, and the people were interested, you know, kings were interested, such as Louis XIV of France, right? Mm -hmm. Were extremely interested. How did they, I mean, what, what happened? How are they so super, uh, you know, successful? Well, I am, of course, swallowing a lot of history in between, but uh, you no, know, we cannot go into detail. And then in France, on, uh, well, uh, at, at the same time, it was both, um, both, uh, in Russia, in Russia of Peter the Great, and in France, where they became, decided to import this nationalism. And in Russia of Peter the Great, it was just the interest of the Tsar, who was all powerful, autocratic, to, to make his huge country as successful and active and motivated as England was. He actually went, he met with William, you know, the, uh, who was the King William, right, in the beginning of the, uh, of the 18th century, and he understood how it worked, and he wanted to kind of drum national consciousness into the skulls of his uh, servitors, and was very successful having the power of an absolutely autocratic rule. And at the same time, in France, aristocracy suffered very much from uh, the absolutism of Louis XIV. And the aristocracy observing England, they were very, uh, very dedicated England watchers. They saw that its extraordinary success was very much connected to the uh, vitality of the aristocracy, the English aristocracy. And so the French decided to import nationalism. They actually were explicit in that. They said things like, 
we too must become a nation. You know, and this is how how this uh, uh, extraordinary new view started to spread. Um, now, however, when those countries such as Russia and France and then others were uh, importing nationalism, this was no longer individual experience as in England. So their nationalism became very different. The implementation of those principles of popular sovereignty and egalitarianism was very different from England and in fact very different between them either. So in France, first of all, the nation was defined as a collective, as a collective individual, you see, instead of thinking about the rights and qualities and desires, interests of the individuals composing the nation, you know, they thought about the rights and will and uh, interests of the nation as a whole. Right. Right? And uh, so this was a collectivistic nationalism in distinction to English, American, Australian, Anglo nationalism. This was individualistic. And this, the, the uh, French was collectivistic. Now, when the nationalism is individualistic, when you define the nation as an association of individuals, the membership in such a nation is by definition voluntary because individuals decide if they don't want to be members, they go away. If they want, they ask to become members, right? And so England, from the beginning of its nationalism, from the 16th century, recognized that. And people who wanted to become English, wanted to become members of the nation, they were welcomed, embraced, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, we see this continued in the United States and in uh, France. No, sorry, in Australia. Now, when the nation is defined as uh, a collective individual, like it was both in France and in Russia, because of the different history of the emergence of nationalism there, then there is a possibility for both civic nationalism, that is voluntary, voluntary nationality, equated with citizenship, like it was in England and, uh, and uh, in the United States, there is, if, when it is a collective individual, there are two possibilities. One, that it remains civic. Anyone who wants to become member of the nation is welcome. And this is how it was in France from the beginning of its nationalism and remains like that now, as we see very, very clearly. And why was it that? Because their definition of nationality was based on their achievement. They had France, when it became a nation, was such a developed and proud culture in every possible respect. And because its achievement wasn't the kind of public, you know, didn't have to look for uh, the sources of its, of its um, uh, status anywhere else. It was all visible. So people who admired the French culture were welcome to become French. Mm. Professor Greenfield, um, if, I, if I may uh, just ask you a question. Uh, reading one of your fascinating essays on nationalism's dividends, you, you are talking, basically, my understanding is that you're challenging the, some of the predominant views that nationalism itself was created by capitalism, whereas you have totally 
changed it around, turned it around upside down, and you're claiming that it is actually nationalism that created growth, wealth, and you're also talking about the nationalism's globalization, which is a very specific uh, specific term that you're using. So given the fact that where I'm living in the Balkans, there is certainly no shortage of nationalism, but nationalism has a really negative connotation and has led to a conflict and uh, misery and uh, dismemberment of the larger states and ethnic cleansing and so on. So would you be able to elaborate a little bit on that as well, if, if I may ask you? Yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Sopic, thank you very much. This is a very important uh, question. And uh, I was actually just going there. You see, now, uh, if one doesn't have a fantastic uh, cultural record that is admired by everyone already around, as in France, then importation of nationalism, on which uh, the dignity of every personal identity now depends, you see, that group of importers has to find the source of the dignity of their nation somewhere else. They have never achieved anything. This was the situation in Russia. In fact, they were from all the possible points of view and in Europe considered barbarians, backward, right? You know, Okay, so where would they look for the dignity? They looked for the dignity in the blood and soil. So their definition of their national consciousness, their, their national consciousness emerged as ethnic national consciousness. Here we have ethno-nationalism. And when blood becomes the essential defining characteristic of a population. Of course, this is very exclusive and this is very hostile. And it's very competition for dignity. You see, nationalism is imminently, essentially competitive consciousness. And the competition is always for dignity. It is always for prestige, for the standing among other nations. When you define your identity in ethnic terms, in terms of blood, this is basically in racial terms, right? There is no difference. Then you have to prove all the time that your blood is better than the blood of others. Or in other words, that the blood of others is worse, that it is poisonous, right? And if, if you distinguish by blood, look, we have no pity for chickens, right? We eat them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, when you define the difference between you and other human beings by blood, you would not consider them the same humans, right? Yeah. There would be necessarily some dehumanizing going yeah. on, right? So this is what happens with ethno-nationalism. Now, as nationalism spread, more and more societies were like Russia rather than like France. And none at all were like England and the United States, where there was this individual experience, you see? So that the most widespread nationalism in the world is collectivistic and ethnic nationalism. And it is, well, 
it is very dangerous in its implications for well for everything basically right and this is the reason for most wars for intent for all the wars in the modern period uh, with the exception of anglo dutch wars <laughs> where they uh, you know wanted to prove to the dutch that they you know have better hearing or something like that well but otherwise you see i'm going to capitalism otherwise nationalism will uh my um argument i do not explicitly argue with them but basically you see that my uh, thinking is very different from all those people who uh claim as marxists this is a marxist position you know that uh, uh that uh, the economic process is fundamental and for that reason uh you have capitalism then you will have nationalism so uh i you know my thinking is different because it is based on historical evidence and uh, we know that uh, capitalism emerges after nationalism and that capitalism emerges first in england which was indeed the very first nation you know and that it moves to uh, other countries only after they import nationalism so that given that it is uh, it cannot be the cause of nationalism if it emerges after there is nationalism so uh indeed uh nationalism is very competitive and uh but where you choose to compete in which area you choose to compete depends because the competition is always for dignity depends completely on the area in which you are likely to end on the top so russia for example that is a tremendously competitive uh nation uh it has never competed in uh, the economic sphere so there is no capitalism in russia in fact never was they were not interested they had such a stupendous military power mm. and they invested so much in their high culture and indeed nobody could beat them in either of those yeah. of those respects so the until now this is where they are competing with the rest of the world they're not participating even in the economic development of the world you know they sell sell their oil when they can i mean they have those tremendous natural resources but this is not where they compete uh and uh but if the nationalism is individualistic like in england united states australia then you would be likely to compete in the economic sphere why because economic uh occupations are the occupations of the majority of uh and economic interests are the interests of the majority of the nation right so this is how uh indeed capitalism uh that is more than economy uh more than competitive economy oriented towards growth no and it, it must be because it is oriented towards growth because it is competitive and because it is competitive for dignity when when one starts one can never stop because god knows maybe japan suddenly will emerge and will become you know better or china or something so you have to compete all the time you know to remain in the competition you can never stop uh but of course there are other areas of competition for dignity uh, as well uh dr greenfeld uh could you um you touched briefly on um the um transformation or, or the, the 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 switching of order based on the transcendent uh, political and social order based on a, a transcendent um, uh, vision, uh, a transcendent foundation to one that is worldly based um, with the rise of nationalism. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and, and tell us what happens to religion in this new order um, mm -hmm. and 
how is it different than the role of religion in the past? Yeah. Well, uh, religion in the past, if we, we are talking about monotheistic world, yeah. we are not talking about the other half of the world. Right, yeah. You know? This is very important. That yes. We are only talking about the monotheistic world. Now, uh, in religion in the monotheistic world is everything, right? God is everything. Your personal faith, the personal faith of a believer in one God depends completely on transcendental spheres. One's identity is defined by the relationship to God, right? One's life, one's eternal life, one's significant life is defined by the relationship to God. What happens in this short terrestrial life is really kind of uh, an entryway to the real thing. It, God, it is God that matters. One is here to witness, to serve witness to God. And every community, in fact, is what God has decided it to be. So this is very different from the situation in which this world is meaningful in its own right. And when people actually can decide, can choose in which direction to move it, So the emphasis with the, with the choice, with the uh, emergence of popular sovereignty as uh, one of the principles of uh, the new vision of reality, God necessarily is deprived of his sovereignty. He is demoted. At the same time, he is becoming much less relevant to everyday existence. For many years, I have been starting my classes on nationalism in Europe and, um, and in the United States by asking my students everywhere, everyone in class, to uh, draw a pictogram, which is a very, very quick drawing. I would give them about 30 seconds for the drawing in which they would depict to me uh, the world in which they live. And many of those people were religious people. They would declare themselves to be religious people, either uh, Christians or Muslims. And the remarkable thing about those drawings that they would draw the globe, you know, a circle, and then they would draw various things within that circle. For example, some would draw uh, their country, uh, and maybe their country vis-a-vis -vis some other country. And some would draw, you know, personal things like books and uh, friends holding hands and a dog or something like that, you know. And then I would ask them, and where is God in your world? And many of them actually were religious, you see. And they would, they would be shocked by that. They would be shocked by the fact that they didn't 
have a place for God in their world. God wasn't there. It wasn't, he wasn't relevant. You see? Yeah. And then they realized that they believed themselves to be religious. But it was a wrong belief. They were actually not religious. They realized themselves. <laughs> so, and this doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't mean that many people do not believe that they are religious. They are in fact not religious, but they believe that they are religious because in so many nationalisms, religion becomes redefined as an ethnic characteristic, as an ethnic inborn characteristic. You have this in Christianity, in Orthodox Christianity, in Greece. This is how it is. You know, you're Greek if you are Orthodox. And if you're Orthodox, you're Greek, you know. And the same is true about Poland, you know, with Catholicism. The very definition of Polishness is for that. The same is true in Pakistan, very clearly. It is an ethnic characteristic, Yeah. right? Turkey. Well, yeah, so many, right? Oh, when I said, so this is, but clearly religion in the religious world, you know, in the world in which God decides is not an ethnic characteristic, neither in Islam, nor in Christianity. Religion is, faith is a choice. It is free. One is responsible for it. One is not born with Christian or Muslim blood. No. One makes the most important choice of one's life. Right? This is what religion requires. It requires that this be free. Now, this is not how it is in, in uh, religion now, which is, you know, which is used by, by secular nationalists. They do not have to know that they're secular. Although, of course, very often they are, you know, uh, the foundation of Pakistan, for example, yeah. right, was the foundation by a fundamentally secular man, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. who, who decided, okay, this will be, you know, the foundation of my secular state. Now it is not like that. Uh, many Pakistanis, I mean, huge majority, I imagine they truly believe that this is innate in them, right? Yeah. Uh, but, so it is, you know, you can see religion, or rather, rather a pretense of religion everywhere around the national world, but it is a very different kind of thing now. You know, religion becomes uh, a tool in the hands of nationalists who, in fact, and always pursue completely secular and of competition for dignity in this world. Um, Dr. Greenfield, what uh, what what happens with the um, uh, the notion of um, the separation of church and state or church state relations? Um, you've talked about how um, in pre modern times this. Um, this was not even a, a, a an intelligible uh, issue to to even think about, and yet uh, the modern uh, world is so um, obsessed with it. Could you could you explain why that is? Uh -huh. Well, uh, it is actually an important issue. Of course, before pre modern world, they couldn't uh, believe in it. There was no such well. <laughs> There was no state to begin with, you know, to separate from uh, from the religious establishment and all the 
political establishment was religious, very essentially religious. But especially um, in um, in France, this is a very French problem. France was a very um, ardent convert to the new consciousness of nationalism and to the sovereignty, to the ideal of popular, that is secular sovereignty, the sovereignty of the nation. There could be no two sovereigns. This was, you know, logically impossible. So, the state was defined as uh, a secular state, but it recognized a private sphere, you know, a sphere of freedom from the state which was, one could be, you know, in one's spare time, and at home, one could be, believe whatever one wants. So long as in public, one did not act on those beliefs, right? And something like that, you see, at the United States, of course, in England, there was no separation from church and state, right? So with the, and there is none, <laughs> still, you know, you are, you belong to the, to the, to the state religion. But there is a private sphere, you know, that uh, because of all the others, all the other uh, principles of nationalism, there is always an individualistic uh, nationalism in any case, the individual is supreme and the freedom of the individual is a supreme value. And in the United States, United States was a very important, importantly religious foundation, right? So they had to separate church and state, you know, to recognize that certain spheres, certain spheres belong to the state and others belong very much to the church. Professor Greenfeld, if I can uh, just follow up on uh, Ismail's question. Uh, since the nationalism, obviously, as you uh, so succinctly explained, and in your theories and books, that it's obviously uh, originated in, in Europe, in, in the uh, UK, in England, and then subsequently through, as you said, uh, globalization of nationalisms, it was imported elsewhere in the world. How, in your view, would you be able to elaborate on that a little bit uh, further? How did it affect the, uh, the Muslim world or the, the Middle Eastern countries, predominantly Arab countries, where there was no uh, notion of separation of religion and state as such in the past? Obviously, it's a novelty, and uh, it uh, manifested itself differently in, in those countries, in that part of the world. Okay. Uh, you see, it is a novelty everywhere. In, Christ, in the Christian world, there also was no separation of church and state. It was unimaginable, right? The politics were religious to begin with. Everything in this world was controlled by the transcendental world and its representatives. So the only conflict in Europe, in Western Europe, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, if we are talking about uh, Byzantium and uh, Russia, uh, etc., the Orthodox Christianity, right? We are talking about Caesaropapism, which means that the emperor is the high priest, right? Yeah. 
So uh, there is no idea of the separation of church and state. Well, in Western Europe, the only conflict that existed was the conflict between papacy as this, you know, the biker of Christ on earth and uh, particular kings who themselves wanted to be the vikers. This came uh, into play very clearly in France, which was the first church that separated itself, the Gallic church, you know, from, uh, from uh, the Roman church, because the king considered himself to be the, a direct vicar of, of Christ and the divine right of kings spread it around uh, uh, all of Western Europe. So there was, it was the separation between kingdoms and the papacy, but not separation of church and state by any means. So the separation of church and state is a novelty for any society. Okay, in, in the monotheistic world. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, people who imported nationalism, there is usually a, an elite group of people, you know, an interested elite, an elite to whom nationalism appeals because it brings them dignity. Because nationalism makes one's identity dignified. So in, in the Arab world uh, or, or in the Muslim world more generally, uh, the architects of specific nationalisms, the importers of nationalism were all intellectuals. Um, many of them educated in the West, they were exposed to nationalism. They understood, they, they found it very appealing they wanted to have the basis of their own dignity around them, you know, in their nation people, right? So, and this is uh, how, how it emerged. However, in Russia, for example, I was talking about Russia, they didn't have any great cultural achievements and uh, well, they had to go into blood and earth to find the source of their dignity. But in Islamic countries, in Arab countries in particular, there were no cultural achievements at the time when they imported their nationalism. But there was a huge cultural achievement in the past. And this cultural achievement was the achievement of Islam. A great religion that came from Arabia. And so they made this very tightly connected to their blood and soul. It became completely irreligious. It was secularized in the process. It became a handmaiden of their secular goals. Mm. But it is there, you know, in the very center of their consciousness. They were the people of Islam. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point to make. And, and as we're coming to the, the end of our time, maybe one one final question of you. You pointed very clearly to kind of the origins of, of nationalism, the different histories, and how in many ways it's the, the form ends up being contingent on the factors that are there present. Um, a question I have is, is how fixed are those categories? Or is there shifting between from a kind of collective civic nationalism toward a, a more unitary blood and soil or um, civic move within categories. And, and as that or when that happens, what are some of the uh, 
the fracture points or the tension points that emerge in in that process? Historically, uh, well, so speaking about that sociologically, in terms of uh, the logic of how cultures and societies develop, of course, the availability of all those three types, you know, to the imagination, necess may necessarily, you know, they necessarily attract certain numbers of people from one type to the other types. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is on the individual level. But on the collective level, in terms of statistical tendency, you know, I mean, everyone can decide, every one person can decide that, well, you were brought up in this kind of environment. I was brought up in the Soviet Union, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I decided that I don't like this kind of thing. I like the American way of thinking, you know? So this is possible for the individual to do. But in terms of how societies in mass, you know, transit, historically it has been uh, that the movement is from individualistic towards collectivistic. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah yeah and I, I, that creates a huge political problem yes. um jeremy if you don't mind i actually have one one more question i wanted to uh to try to ask um dr greenfeld before we uh broke up and that is that um the relationship between the nation state or the rise of nationalism. And then you have what Weber talked about, um, the the rise of the bureaucratic state and bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Could you talk about what is the relationship between this sort of totalizing penetration of the you know polity by the state, um, how that arose, how that's related to the ri rise of nationalism? You're talking about a totalitarian state. Yeah, uh, not totalitarian, but even even in say um, just in general, the one of the characteristics of the modern state being that that the 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 state um, has this sort of penetration from the center into the periphery or just to, to everywhere. Now we we have this sort of direct relationship between the individual and the uh, state, whereas in the past you had different mediating um, levels of authority, like guilds and tribes, or um, you know, religion, uh, religious officials, um, uh, feudal lords. Um, but but now, you know, now the the state essentially is the mon uh, the the on the monolith. Uh, or um, uh, how how did that occur? How did that arise? And what what is the relationship between that and uh, nationalism. Well, uh, there have been very centralized governments before. Mm -hmm. uh, one should think about China, for example. For a long, long time before there was any nationalism, they had very well developed bureaucratic um all penetrating state i mean not state but government yeah when one thinks about absolutism for example absolutism of louis the 14th in france under him such bureaucratic all penetrating government was also developing for before nationalism but in general, of course, there can be no separation between the individual and uh, popular sovereignty. The state is the embodiment of popular sovereignty. There is no separation between the individual and the people. The people is not split 
into the national people, is not split into separate orders. Whether it, whether it is uh, an individualistic society or a collectivistic society. The relationship is not simply direct, but uh, it is a self-relationship. It is like being connected to a part of oneself. This is this is what the state is. It represents the nation of which you are a part. So you're basically when when an individual is commune. I mean. It's like talking to oneself, you know. Right? It it is a complete this is this is our consciousness. This is how we live. You see. Mm. Mm. So that's why in individualistic societies we always have the right to criticize, to judge, you know, our top you know, oh, president, for example, right? I mean, we are equal. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe he is not representing me. And, mm -hmm. and, and we are completely equal. Um, and in collectivistic societies, the state is even more powerful because it not not only that it represents the people, but it represents the people, the nation to itself. You see, one only knows one's identity from that representation. So, our relationship to the state and in general to the nation is very similar to the relationship between the individual and God. When, I mean, analogous, you see, um, analogous, not, yes. not similar, yes. general. But this was, uh, the relationship was extremely intimate. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. It looks like we may have froze there. Um, mm -hmm. But um, that may be actually a, a fine place to end of um, yeah. really setting the, the stage for a number of conversations that will be, be coming in the weeks ahead on on so many of these, these topics. Um, and so for Osma and Professor Greenfield, Thank you for for setting the stage um, at at really I think a fascinating conversation that will pick up on on many of these threads throughout of of that question of the relationship between the individual and the state between um, religious communities and the state um, and what some of the those challenge or flashpoints are in that conversation and even how those identities are are shifting. Um, and how to respond to that. Um, so with that, uh, Osman, Ismail, thank you for, for joining me today and look forward to picking up these conversation in the weeks ahead. Yes. Thank you thank for joining you. us. Um, look forward to it. Thank you very much. Great. And you can learn more about the Religious Freedom Institute on our website at, at rfi.org. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for your time and being with us. Bye-bye. Thank you, Osman. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Salam.